I really appreciate that encouragement Pastor Dan gave at the beginning of just being together. It's such a, a sweet thing for, for me to be with you guys and for us all to be together. And it really is, it's just that simple. And it, it's, it's glorious. It's a gift from Jesus. And uh, we do. We love you guys. And we're, we're glad to gather in the house of the Lord on the Lord's day, week by week with you all. And with that, today, we start a new book of the Bible. So if you would, get, uh, grab your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of John. This is a big deal for me. I'm, I'm thrilled and honored to be able to teach this book. Um, this is it's a book that is just so loved by so many believers, and we know that. And so often when someone comes to faith in Christ, the first thing you hear people encourage them to do is to read the Gospel of John. When I very first started teaching, uh, I was teaching in the children's ministry, uh, the way we would do it is the pastor of the church was teaching through a book of the Bible, and I would listen to his sermon from the week before, and then teach that to the children. And so he was teaching through the Gospel of John, so this is where it all really started for me, uh, even as just learning how to teach the Bible and to teach uh, children. And so now all these years later to be standing before you uh, as the pastor of this church teaching the Gospel of John, I'm, it's, it's an honor. And I'm very excited about the fruit that will come from our adventure, the, the journey as we work our way through this book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And so I praise God for the privilege that we have as a family to go through this book and what God is going to do in it. Amen? And so with that, allow me just to pray one more time for us. Father God, uh, we come before you in humble dependence. Lord, we need you, Father, to speak to us by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you cause your words to come to life, and would they minister to us, Lord, in our, our deepest needs, doubts, fears, failures, regrets, concerns, whatever it may be. Lord God, would you minister to us by your word? God, would you use me to bless your people and to feed your sheep? You love your people, God. You love us dearly, and you've given us your word, and you've given us your Holy Spirit so that we could understand and learn and grow by your word. And so we come with confidence and boldness today, knowing, God, that you will indeed meet us, and we thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, hallelujah. So we're going to start wide here. I'm going to start by talking about the... the the disciple, John, and then we'll talk a little bit about the book itself, and then we're going to look at the first five verses of chapter one today. So that's kind of the, the direction that we are going to go. So I'm in teaching mode today, and so I'm here to teach. You are here to learn. I want you guys to be good Bible students, good theologians. It's not like the theologians belong in the classroom and, and the rest of us are just, you know, whatever. No, the, uh, the Christians are supposed to be equipped and sharp with the Word of God. And there was, um, gosh, I, I heard this story, I don't even want to butcher it, but the, there was a guy that uh, first began to work on translating the Scriptures into the English language, and he said that the plowboy was going to be more equipped with the knowledge of the Word of God than the, than the priest. And that was his intention, that the Word of God could be accessible to all peoples and that we would all have the Word of God in our language and by the Spirit of God we would be students. We would be theologians, right? And so that's my expectation for us here. And so I'm excited to be able to share this with you today because it is deep. This is some very deep stuff that we'll be getting into. And so, as it is, the Gospel of John is written by the Apostle John. He's one of the twelve disciples, not... John the Baptist. We'll be learning about John the Baptist in the coming weeks, but this is written by John the disciple. We know John was a fisherman, and uh, so was his brother James, and they were fishing partners with Peter. John's father's name was Zebedee, and so you've probably heard that. And John was part of the, uh, the inner circle, we would call it. And so that would be John, James, and Peter. And John seemed to have kind of a special relationship with Jesus. In fact, uh, at the cross, John uh, was given the responsibility by Jesus to 
take care of Jesus' mother after Jesus passed away. I don't know if you know that or not. It's, it's pretty fascinating. There at the cross, Jesus said to John, Son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. Because John was the only one that followed Jesus to the cross. Did you know that? Out of all the disciples, they took off when Jesus was betrayed, when he was arrested and taken off to trial. John was the only one that followed Jesus all the way to the cross. And that, to me, is very commendable. I think that's pretty, pretty awesome. I, I love that about John. Uh, we know that in John's early years, he was somewhat of a hothead. Uh, Jesus gave him the, the nickname, him and his brother, uh, the Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. And uh, we think that has something to do with this account where Jesus came in and was snubbed by these people. And, and John said, hey, Lord, should we call down you know, fire out of heaven and consume them like Elijah? And Jesus said, look, you don't know what spirit you're of. And so he was kind of a hothead. But it, it's funny because over the course of the years, he became known as the apostle of, anybody know? The apostle of love. That's right, the apostle of love. Just over and over and over in his writings, uh, he speaks of the necessity of loving God and loving others. It's just that simple. We believe John was one of the youngest. He was one of the youngest of the apostles. Over the years, I have heard different things, like he, he could have been a teenager. But in all likelihood, he was probably about the age of Jesus. He was probably around 30, 33 years old um, when Jesus was there in his public ministry and he was following Jesus. But John outlived all of the other apostles. John was the only one that did not die a martyr's death. Everybody else was beheaded or crucified. I mean, just horrific uh, stuff that happened to all of the apostles, the, the disciples who followed Jesus there in his earthly ministry. But John outlived them all. Now, he was persecuted, and tradition has it that he was, uh, he was immersed in a boiling cauldron of oil, and he didn't die, and so they banished him to the island of Patmos, and that is uh, what we have, the book of Revelation. John is there on the island where he receives the revelation of Jesus Christ, and he was there because he had been banished there, and that was all persecution that he suffered, but he didn't die. And he, we believe that he basically spent his last years in Ephesus, and he died there of natural causes, probably between 90 years old to 100 years old. And so he was an old man when he died. And so there were actually rumors that John wasn't going to die until Jesus returned. And we'll, we'll see that. That's in John chapter 21. Uh, kind of fascinating stuff. He, he kind of sets that, that straight. Uh, John, he, he kind of acknowledges that rumor and says that's not true. But nonetheless, there was a strange rumor circulating to that end. John also wrote, not only did he write the Gospel of John, but he also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the epistles, uh, three little books towards the end of the Bible, and he wrote uh, the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And just so you know, it's revelation, not revelations. Okay? And I say that because most people say revelations, and I just, while I'm on the topic, that's not it. So I'll see if you catch yourself next time you refer to that book. It's the book of the Revelation. Now, John wrote these things much later in his life. John wrote these books much later, and so as a result, the gospel that we are looking at here is vastly different than the other gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what are known as the synoptic Gospels. And what, what is meant by that word synoptic is that they are very similar in content. They basically cover the same, the same details, more or less. But John is vastly different. It is assumed by this point that much of that information was well known in the other three Gospels. So the Gospel of John is 93%, approximately 93% unique content. That's pretty cool, huh? And so the Gospel of John is very unique. John writes it much later, and he, he adds a lot more to it that wasn't covered in the other Gospels. For instance, Jesus turning the water into wine, chapter 2. Nicodemus, chapter 3. The woman at the well, John chapter 4. The woman caught in adultery, John chapter 8. The raising of Lazarus from the dead, John chapter 11. Jesus washing the disciples' feet, chapter 13. 
Jesus' high priestly prayer, chapter 17, and then the restoration of Peter after Peter had betrayed or abandoned Jesus, rather, in chapter 21. And then, of course, the seven I am statements that are uh, just all throughout the whole gospel, which we'll talk about that in a moment. All of that is unique to the gospel of John. And so it's a, it's a very awesome book for that reason. And I'm excited, even as I read through that list, to cover all of those texts with you as we work our way through the book. So one of the major themes in the Gospel of John is Jesus is God, the deity of Christ. And so you may or may not know this, but each one of the Gospels kind of portrays a different aspect or slant, if you will, to the person of Jesus Christ. So in Matthew, Matthew goes out of his way to present Jesus as the king. He is the Messiah. He is the king of Israel, the one who was foretold throughout the Old Testament. And then in Mark, he's portrayed to us as the servant. And there's that classic verse where Jesus says that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Luke deals with the humanity of Jesus Christ. He is the Son of Man. He is the one who came to live amongst us and to live as a man, to die as a man in place of sinful men and women. And then John portrays Jesus as God, God among us, God in the flesh, the deity of Christ. And what's fascinating when you kind of link all of those together, what you have is this interesting picture of Jesus as the servant king and the God-man. And so it's just fascinating how God's Word comes together. I see God's fingerprints even on that. And that, that in and of itself is so unique, that our Savior would be the servant king and the God-man. And so jo uh, John's ultimate objective here is to portray to us Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. And one of the classic, classic texts that we'll look at later in much more detail is John chapter 8. John chapter 8, uh, Jesus is talking to the Jews there, and uh, this fascinating statement, John chapter 8, verse 56, Jesus says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and he was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And so this is just jam-packed uh, with amazing content. Just that text right there. Jesus says that he met Abraham, that Abraham saw his day and was glad. And, and we'll get into that a little later, uh, what point in the Old Testament we think Jesus may actually be referring to here. But they were like, man... You're not even 50 years old. You're trying to say you saw Abraham. And then he says, before Abraham was, I am. And of course, we know that statement well. When, uh, when God revealed himself to Moses there in the burning bush in Exodus, and he commissioned Moses to go to Egypt and to tell Pharaoh to set God's people free, he said, who should I say sent me? And what was God's response? Tell them that I am sent you. I am that I am. And so when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, that is a total claim to deity. I mean, he is putting himself on par with, with God the Father there. And they knew this. There was no mistake, because what were they going to do? What, did they, what was their response to that? They were going to take up stones and kill him, which was what you were supposed to do against blasphemy in the Old Testament law. And so they knew there was no mistake what Jesus was claiming there. And so we find that in the Gospel of John, but then that helps us kind of understand the seven I am statements. You may or may not be familiar with that, but throughout the book, Jesus says things like, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine, and you are the branches, right? Does that sound familiar to us? And so even in all of those statements, Jesus is taking to himself that title, that claim that he is the I am. And so make no mistake, it could not be more clear 
that John is portraying to us, presenting to us Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, second person of the Trinity. That's what we'll be talking about a little bit more here in just a moment. But John actually tells us in the gospel why he wrote the gospel. He actually gives us the purpose statement of the book. And I love it when the books of the Bible actually do that. Because as Bible students, that is our goal. Our goal is to get to the point. What is the author actually trying to say here? What is his objective? What is his goal in communicating? Authorial intent. That's just a fancy way of saying what is the author trying to communicate? Isn't that what we try to do when we talk to each other? I want to know what you're saying and what you mean by it. I don't theorize and, and you know, turn it into some kind of a, a mystery and, and try to look for hidden meanings. I mean, we do kind of do that. with some. Well, I wonder what they really meant by that, or especially text messages, right? But the, the reality is, if I send you a message, if I email you, write you a letter, or I'm talking to you, I, I want you to understand what I'm trying to say. There is a reason, there is a point. And so what we will often do is say, well, to me that means, and then the next person will say, oh yeah, well, I got something totally different out of that, because to me it means, and we approach the Word of God like that. But what we really want to know is, what did John, John mean? by the, the Holy Spirit. What, is, what does it mean? What is, what is he really trying to get after here? And so we want to get to the core of it. And so John actually tells us in John chapter 20, verse 30, he says, Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John said, there's much that I could have compiled here that I didn't, but the things that I have here I have specifically specifically selected so that you would believe on the name of Jesus Christ, that you would know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and in believing, you would have life in His name. So that's that's His purpose in the Gospel of John. John's objective is to put forth the person and work of Jesus to Christ, to put, uh, Jesus Christ, to put him on full display so that we would have an accurate understanding of who Jesus is, and with that understanding, we would believe unto eternal life. So this is an ev- evangelistic book. It's an evangelistic book, to be sure. So right out the gate, right out the gate, as we begin to get into John chapter 1, John is going to give us an astonishing look at Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's astonishing. And it is critical because there is a lot of confusion, folks, in the world today about who Jesus is. A lot of confusion. There's a lot of confusion amongst false uh, movements, heretical movements that try to present a false Christ altogether. And we'll deal with that a little bit. But even in the church, there's much confusion about Jesus. And I would say even in this room right here today, there is confusion. At the very least, we may have an accurate understanding of Jesus, but not really know why we believe the things that we believe. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you've even been able to communicate true things about Jesus. But you don't know exactly where that came from in the Word of God. And so we're going to see that today in the text before us. And so as we look at the first five verses of John chapter 1, there's going to be five things, five things that are going to be put on display for us about Jesus in each verse, in uh, each one of the verses. The first thing that we'll see is the deity of Christ, that Jesus is God. The second thing that we're going to see is the preexistence of Christ. And I'll, I'll unpack these things as we go. The third thing that we'll see is the creative agency of Christ. He is creator. The fourth thing that we will see is the self-existence of Christ. And I'll obviously get into that. That sounds much like the pre-existence, but there is a distinction. And then lastly, we're going to see the omnipotence of Christ, the power of Jesus. And so all of that laid out for us in the first five verses by John. It's, it's amazing. And I'm so overwhelmed that I almost want to just pray again before we get into this. It's like, God, help me. Because this is deep, it's glorious, it's profound. And uh, if nothing else, may it cause us to praise God more and to love God more and to honor Christ more because He's worthy 
of our praise. And as we have a, a more clear picture, uh, picture or vision of the Christ, man, may we be moved to a deeper place of devotion and service and obedience. Amen? So with that, let's look at our text. In fact, let's just uh, read it together. Why don't you guys just stand for a moment? Let's honor God's Word together. This is the Word of the Lord. John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. As I've already stated, point number one, we see the deity of Christ. That is that Jesus Christ is God. Verse one says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this statement, in the beginning, this clearly harkens back to Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so we're going to see themes throughout this text, even this chapter that, that goes back. It's very reminiscent of Genesis chapter 1, creation. And here, John refers to Jesus as the Word. So in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He is talking about Jesus, but he's talking about Jesus Christ from eternity past. And so before Jesus was born of a virgin born there in, uh, as a Nazarene, he existed eternally as what we will, what John calls the Word. The Greek, the Greek word there is, is logos, logos. And so I'll be referring to the pre-incarnate Christ, the Word, and we're talking about essentially Jesus as we understand him, but before, before he was born there, before he, he came into uh, became God incarnate, God in the flesh, God among us. Does that make sense? You tracking with me? And so there, there is a distinction to be made. It's the, the, same, the same one, the same person, second person of the Trinity, but he did exist before he was born, as a, uh, born of a virgin there. And so John speaks of him as the Word. And so what does John mean by this? What does John mean in the beginning was the Word? Well, Logos is a complex Greek thought. Uh, in Greek thought, logos is very complex. It, it means divine logic and reason. Um, and it it's, uh, can be very challenging as you try to really dig into this, but it, it also has a very strong Hebrew connotation. And I believe that's more easily understood, and I think that's what John is getting at here. And it essentially means the, the perfect communication. So Jesus is the Word of God. What does that mean? Simply put, Jesus is the perfect communication of who God is. Jesus is the perfect expression of who God is. The Father. The Father has communicated and He has revealed Himself to us most fully in the person of Jesus Christ. I, I, I contend that that is the best way to understand this phrase, Logos. In the beginning was the Word. Jesus, pre-incarnate, the perfect expression, revelation, communication of who the Father is. And when He took on flesh, when the divine Word became a man and dwelt among us, He embodied what God is like for us, the Father, who the Father is. And Hebrews chapter 1 says that very thing. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person. I believe the NASB translates that the exact imprint. And so God has spoken in times past by prophets, but in these last days He has finally, most authoritatively, most completely, and most fully spoken to us by His Son, who is the perfect and complete revelation of the Father to us. Je uh, Jesus he says that very thing in John chapter 14, verse 7. He says, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. 
Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He says, He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? And so Jesus makes clear, if you've seen Him, you've seen the Father. Have you ever wondered what God is like, what the Father is like? Look no further than His Son. Truly. There's a lot of confusion in the world today, I think, even in our own minds and hearts, how we understand the Father. But if you look at Jesus, how He carried Himself, how He loved others, the holiness of Christ, everything about Him, that's the Father. The Son truly reflects the glory and the character and the nature of, of the Father so, so very well. And so, Jesus, as the Word of God, God in the flesh, is the perfect communication of God. You know what I love about that? God knows how to communicate. Isn't that awesome? God knows how to communicate. He's a master communicator. And so you don't ever have to worry about missing. If God's got something to say to you, if God's got something that He's going to reveal to you, He's going to, and we're not going to miss it. Man, praise God for that, because I, you know, I miss things, right? I get distracted, I wonder, and we're always agonizing over trying to figure certain things out or understand certain things about God or what direction would God have us go. God is a master communicator. He communicates well. And His Son, Jesus, is the Word of God. He is the perfect communication of the Father to man. And so know that. God leads well. God communicates well. God guides well. And so I praise God for that. So that is Jesus Christ as the Word of God. But what does John say about the Word specifically? He says that the Word was with God. That the Word was with God and the Word was God. Now mark that down, folks. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, that's as clear-cut as it can get. Clear-cut statement about Jesus Christ and the deity of Christ. He is God in the flesh, the God-man. And so, John is clearly portraying Jesus as more than just a man. And that's important for us to note, because there are a lot of people who will say, oh yeah, I believe Jesus, and that He was a good moral teacher, He was a prophet, but nothing more. But if you're going to believe what the Word of God says about Him, then you can't say that because John clearly states that Jesus was God. Jesus is God. And John does not portray Jesus as just a God. And that's important for us to note because the Mormons, that's exactly what they say about Jesus. And in fact, if you look at their Bible, this same verse, they've inserted the definite article A. And so in the beginning was the Word the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That's a big difference, don't you think? And they would say that Jesus is one among many gods, and that we too can be a God. And so you have to do the right things in this earth, this world, to worship the, the current God to whom this world belongs. And if you do that, then you will become a God. And so it's, it's all kinds of goofiness there, but... That's just one example of how this is distorted. It is perverted. And it is crystal clear Jesus is not just a God, a God among many other gods. And John does not portray Jesus as a deity on a lesser plane than God the Father. Um, there was a false teaching in the early church called Arianism. And they would say that Jesus is a God but that He's not of the same essence of the Father Himself, and so He's a lesser God, if you will. And so that's really what the Mormon theology about Jesus is, and so it's just repackaged into Mormonism, but it's not new. And that's the way that false doctrines throughout church history are. And so a lot of what we see in the day and age that we live in, it's not new. It just is repackaged throughout church history in different forms. And so Mormonism is, a, is essentially... Uh, a repackaged version of an ancient heresy called Arianism. And so they would say that Jesus is not, uh, he's not of the same essence as the Father, and so he's a lesser being than the Father. And so there was actually a creed in 325 A.D. that was put together. All of these pastors, theologians came together, and they, they hammered all of this out. What does the Word of God clearly teach? This wasn't anything new. 
But they had to defend it for the first time in history. People were coming up and challenging the truth of who Jesus was. And so the pastors and theologians came together, and they spent much time going to the Word of God and ironing out what does the Bible actually say about Jesus Christ in, in, this, in regard to this. And so this is just a little snippet of a statement that they uh, put together uh, called the Nicene Creed in 325 A.D. It says, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages. Now listen to this. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. So the Son and the Father are one, one in essence. And so um, that was attacked early on in the church, but many uh, godly men came together and they fought that, and Arianism was shot down as a false teaching, but it has resurfaced in various forms. And so we have to be aware of this, and we have to know what the Word of God says. And so Jesus is not less than the Father. The Son is not less than the Father. The, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they are the same in essence, and they share equality. John also says not only was the Word God, but the Word was with God. Now, this is important. John is making a distinction here. So, Jesus, the, the second person of the Trinity, the Word of God, is God, right? But He is also distinct from God, distinct from the Father, if you will. And that's important to note because there have been other false teachings throughout church history that came up uh, in this regard. One was called patripassionism, and that means the Father suffered. That's literally what the word means. And so they would claim that the Father actually died on the cross. And so uh, that's, that's false. And so we have to understand that we believe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are, they are one in essence, but they are distinct in persons. This is obviously a mystery uh, here, and I'm going to talk more about this in a moment. But we have to recognize that the Bible portrays the Trinity as such. And so Jesus, the Son, is not less than the Father in essence, but He is also distinct from the Father. So the Father didn't die on the cross, Jesus did. Does that make sense? You tracking with me? And so um, there's another teaching that is people hold to in our day and age. It's called modalism. Modalism is that the Father became the Son and is now the Spirit. So they reject Trinitarian doctrine, Trinitarian theology. And so that's the same thing as patripassionism. And so, again, like I said, it just keeps popping up and resurfacing in different forms. So Jesus is God in the flesh. He is of the same essence as the Father. They are one. He is not less than the Father, but at the same time, He is distinct from the Father. You tracking with me? I know this is like heavy stuff. You guys are just, you know, I, I'm, you know, even as I'm trying to walk through this stuff, I'm like, God help me, you know. But this is, uh, it's, uh, it's heavy, man. There's no other way. Modern vernacular, it's heavy. And so, Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He is the Word of God. He is God in the flesh. He is no less than that. And point two here, John is going to. Uh, deal with the pre-existence of Christ. And that is, Jesus is eternal. And so verse 2 there, He was in the beginning with God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So when the beginning began, the Word was already there. When the beginning began, the Word, the second person of the Trinity, was already there. Jesus Christ has existed from eternity past as the second person of the Trinity. And so, as, as far as it pertains to the doctrine of the Trinity, there's, there's just some simple ways to, to, to think about this. The Bible clearly portrays the Holy Spirit as God, the Father as God, and Jesus as God. That much is clear. But the Bible also is very clear that we don't believe in three gods, we are monotheistic. The Bible is clear there is one God. There's not three gods. And so, and there is, is the issue. So all three are God, but we don't believe there are three different gods. And so they are one in essence, one God, distinct in persons, three persons. 
And so what is the Father? He is God. Who is He? He is Father. What is the Son? He is God. Who is He? He is the Son. What is the Holy Spirit? He is God. Who is He? He is the Holy Spirit of God. And so they are one in essence. They are God, but they are distinct in persons. And we relate to all three persons of the Trinity. God created all things. God devised the whole plan of salvation. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to accomplish said plan on our behalf. And then the Holy Spirit comes and applies that to us when we believe on Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And so we relate to all three persons of the Trinity differently. Does that make sense? And so uh, we are Trinitarian. And so if you are a student of the Word of God, you can't help but come away with that understanding. And so we're talking here about the second person of the Trinity who has existed from all of eternity past. Jesus did not just come into existence when he was born of a virgin. He pre-existed, right? And so there was a, another creed that actually had to defend this. I believe it was in the 5th, 6th century. It's called the Athanasian Creed. And it states it this way. We worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence. So what he's saying there is we don't blend them all together so that it's, you know, um, there's no distinction between the three. There is the person of the Father, the person of the Son, the person of the Spirit. But we don't divide their essence either. We don't make them three different gods. He says, For the person of the Father is a distinct person, the person of the Son is another, and that of the Holy Spirit still another. But the divinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one. Their glory equal, their majesty co-eternal. And so they are one in essence, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but they are distinct in persons. But they are equal in glory, and they are uh, co-eternal, having always existed. Jesus says it like this in John chapter 17, verse 4. Jesus says, I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So Jesus says that I have come, I have done your will, Father. Now I desire to go back to the glory that we shared before the world existed. So Jesus is praying to the Father here, and he's speaking of a time before creation even happened where he dwelt with the Father in perfect glory, the glory that he shared with God. Now, that's significant because God says he'll share his glory with no one, but God and the Son did share their glory uniquely because they were one. Now, if Jesus were not equal with God, this would... We don't really catch this. I think, that, I think this is kind of lost on us. But maybe, let me try to maybe put it in a, in a different context. When Jesus puts himself on the same level with God, if that were not true, then that ought to cause us to almost cringe or feel uncomfortable. And the best way I know to describe this is when Donald Trump was the president, I, I saw a T-shirt that said, Jesus is my Savior, Donald Trump is my president. And... That just made me cringe a little bit because it's like putting them in the same category almost, you know? I mean, that's, that's, that's through and through. That's like in the South. That's the way that the, in the South, I mean, it's, it's all conflated. God, guns, and glory, you know? And so it's, it's, you know, the president and Jesus and guns and, you know, it's just all of that is, it's all, you know, on the same level. But that's, you hear that and you think something's just not right about that. Okay, you can't put you know Jesus and Donald Trump in the same sentence uh, like that, as though they were you know even remotely on the same level somehow, you know. And so um, that's kind of what we got going on here, you know. When, when Jesus talks about sharing the glory, glory with the Father, that would essentially be the same thing if it weren't true, if it weren't so. But He and the Father are one, and they do share that glory. They they are. Uh, co-eternal and uh, glorious in, in essence and all of that. So uh, such is the case with Jesus, and it is right. He is eternal. He has existed eternally with the Father. And it's kind of fascinating because before Jesus was born of a virgin and the Gospels, uh, before we see that there, 
Um, we do see what we believe are appearances of the pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament. Did you know that? Really fascinating stuff. But we believe that the second person of the Trinity was active in the Old Testament. There's this really interesting character called the angel of the Lord. And the word angel, sometimes that can, be, that can throw us a little bit. We hear angel, we think wings and all of that. But the word angel can simply mean messenger. And so there is this messenger, the messenger of Yahweh. And so this happens all throughout the Old Testament. It's really fascinating. But I think the most amazing account is in Judges chapter 13. When Samson is going to be born, this angel, the, the messenger of Yahweh, comes to Samson's parents and tells them of this miraculous child who is to come. And so Samson's dad, his name is Manoah, and it says in Judges 13, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name, that when your words come to pass, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said, Why do you ask my name, seeing that it is wonderful? And that just right there, immediately, to me, that takes my mind to Isaiah, where speaking of Jesus, his name is Wonderful Counselor. In verse 19, it says, So Manoah took the young goat with a grain offering and offered it upon the rock to the Lord, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. And it happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended into the flame of the altar. And when Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. And when the angel of the, the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. And so it's really fascinating. There's this, this character in the Old Testament that they clearly know who he is. He's the messenger of the Lord, of Yahweh. And he comes and he says, hey, what's your name? And he says, why do you want to know my name, seeing that it is wonderful? And then he literally gets in the sacrifice and ascends. And so that's like receiving worship there. He's tampering with the, the offering that is given to God. And then he ascends up. And then when they see this, they say, we have seen God today. And so no one's seen God at any point. The Bible is clear. God is spirit. Only the Son has seen the Father, and He declares the Father to us. And so even in the Old Testament, and there are several of these, we see places where we believe the second person of the Trinity was even, was even acting there before He was born uh, as a babe there in, in the manger. So that's all incredible stuff, right? And so at a particular point, at a particular point, the pre-incarnate Word took on flesh. At a particular point in God's determined time in human history, the one who existed from all of eternity past as the second person of the Trinity, the Word of God, took on flesh and He dwelt among us. And He became a man, truly man. And so this is what we call the dual nature of Christ. The one who has existed from all of eternity past stepped into time and space and took on flesh and became a man and dwelt among His creation. And so we see that in Hebrews chapter 10, and we're just going to kind of close with this right here for today. And so it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, it said, It is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That is why when Christ came into the world, He said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the Scriptures. It's a really fascinating text. So it's like this conversation that is happening with Jesus and the Father, with the Son and the Father. And Jesus says, you know, the, the sacrificial system, it was not permanent. It was temporary and it was not able to truly bring forgiveness of sin to sinful men and women. And so God had something in mind so much greater than that. The Father had this plan of salvation, and His Son was going to come into the world, take on flesh, and He was going to give Himself as the sacrifice for our sin, the ultimate sacrifice for sin. And He says, it's really fascinating, when Christ came into the world... He says, you have given me a body to offer. So it's like this conversation happening between the Father and the Son in eternity past. And at a certain point in time, He stepped into humanity, taking on a body that the Father had prepared for Him. And He became the God-man, uniquely, truly God, 
truly man. And so he was able to live the life that none of us could live because he was uniquely, distinctly God, and only God could live a perfect life. But at the same time, he was able to represent us perfectly as one who was truly human and walked in our shoes, as it were, and experienced temptation in all points, yet without sin. He kept God's law perfectly, perfectly. Imagine that. In every thought and in every action and everything that he did, as a, as, a, as a human in our place, yet truly God, He fulfilled God's will, and then He died in our stead as a sacrifice, as a substitute. And that is what we see most clearly spelled out for us in Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, it says this, "...have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who though He existed in the form of God did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. So there it is. Jesus, He existed, He pre-existed in the form of God. And even though He was equal to God, He didn't cling on to that. He didn't, he didn't fight for that. For a time, He emptied Himself, it says here. And He took on the appearance of a man. Verse 7, He emptied Himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so there it is. There's the ultimate reason that Jesus came. He came to reveal to us the Father. And that he did. He could say, look at me, you have seen the Father. But he also revealed much more about the Father through the gospel message, which is what we have for us. You have a holy and a perfect God, and then you have sinful men and women, rebels against God's holiness and goodness. And we have to give an account to God for that, for that rebelliousness, for that sinfulness. So God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He sent His Son, His one and only Son, gave Him a body that He could come here and live the life that we could not live in perfect obedience to the Father, and then He died the death that we deserved in our place. He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so what does He reveal to us in this about God, about the Father? That the Father is holy. That He is dangerously and furiously holy. And that His standard is a holy and a righteous standard that no one could meet. Nobody could ever meet it because it's perfection. It's perfection. He dwells in unapproachable light. But God is at the same time gloriously gracious. And He is so incredibly uh, merciful and kind. And so He sent His his Son Jesus to, to live in our place and to die in our place. And so here in the Gospel we see The judgment, the holiness, the wrath of God collide with the mercy and the kindness and the grace of God. And all of that is presented to us so very clearly as the Word of God took on flesh and revealed God's nature to us through the gospel, through the cross, through the resurrection. And then He extends forgiveness to us that if we would trust Christ, if we would believe in His finished work for salvation, we would have life evermore, eternal life, everlasting life. It is ours to be had if only we trust in His Son. And so truly Jesus has revealed all of this to us. He has revealed the Father to us uh, so gloriously through the gospel and through the cross. And so that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We'll pick up here next week as we move on. But can we just praise God? Can we pray right now and thank God for all that He has done in sending us a Savior? Lord Jesus, we love you, and we can't thank you enough that you did what you have done. Though you existed in glory from eternity past as God, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, eternally begotten, you stepped down in time and space. You dwelt among your own creation. You were obedient to the Father in all points, and you give us your righteousness as a gift if we would but trust you. Thank you for revealing the Father to us more perfectly. Thank you, Father God, that you have done such a thing, that you have revealed yourself to us in your Son. 
not only revealing yourself, God, but making a way for us to have right relationship with you, that we can know you savingly, personally. So we praise you, Father. Thank you that you are a God who does reveal. Thank you that you are a God who does communicate, and you have communicated to us in your Son. And thank you for communicating ultimately through the gospel, your grace and your mercy and your love. I pray for anyone in this room today who doesn't know that love, that they would call upon the name of Jesus today, that they would cry out to the one who loves them, to the one who can save, that they would fall on his mercy, that they would humble themselves and repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. God bless you all. See you next week.